Okay, here we go. So today we're going to continue on with more limits, okay? And we're, we're still going to look at some just like from section 2.1 where the limit goes to a particular number. But today we're specifically going to look at positive and negative infinity. Um, you're also seeing a little bit of the sandwich theorem. I'm going to save that for a different day. Um, that I'd like to, you know, take more time than what your book tends to cover for it. Uh, so we'll look at that as well. Um, and then it says infinite limits where x approaches a number, meaning the answer is going to come out to infinity, like where it's going up forever and ever, down forever and ever, which we saw a few of those. Um, and then some end behavior models as well. Um, end behavior models are usually just a part of the function that we're talking about. Um, so I'll show you, you know, as we get to it. So finite limits are limits that go where x goes to infinity or negative infinity. So if you're looking at a graph, here's where x is infinity, here's where x is negative infinity. So it's really referring to the left and right sides of the graph, okay? Not at a particular number in between, but at the left side or the right side. This symbol for infinity does not represent a real number at all. It's just saying you're going towards the highest number that happens to be there, whatever it happens to be. And as soon as you think you reach it, guess what? There's a number even bigger. Okay, so you never can get to it. And so for that reason, we tend to use like parentheses with it because we cannot get to infinity. Um, we use it to describe the behavior of a function when the value in its domain or range outgrow all of the bounds on the graph. So we say the limit of f of x um, as x approaches infinity, okay? We mean that the limit of f as x moves increasingly far to the right on the number line. And then the same thing as far as negative infinity, far to the left of the number line. And these ends tend to go toward the horizontal asymptote, okay? If they're going to question it, many times it goes to a horizontal asymptote. Um, unless it'd be like, you know, y equals x squared. Well, the left end goes to positive infinity, and the right end goes to positive infinity. You know, so um, you can see it, you know, either way, where it goes up, down, or to um, an, a horizontal asymptote. And that's why horizontal asymptotes come up in this section as well. Whenever you have an equation that is y equals a number, they have b in your book, um, that's a horizontal asymptote. And if a graph has a horizontal asymptote, usually the ends will go towards it. So you can see here, the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x equals b, or the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x equals b. Many times for most functions, um, unless it's a piecewise function, but for most functions, it would have like one horizontal asymptote and both ends would go towards that asymptote. But I think I showed you a graph on Friday that had two horizontal asymptotes. And that would be one that's more of a piecewise function where, you know, this side is doing this, this side is doing this over here, okay? So you can see here, this is where X is approaching positive or negative infinity. So there's two types of problems today, either where X is approaching it or where Y is approaching. They throw them in the same section and say, this is where infinity is involved, okay? So here is our first one, um, our, our first graph that we're looking at today. It says, use the graph in the table to find the limit as x approaches infinity. So that's the right side. And the limit as x approaches negative infinity. And then it says, identify all horizontal asymptotes. Quite honestly, if I wrote a textbook, my question for part A would be, find the horizontal asymptotes. Because once you have the horizontal asymptotes, you have the answers to the other two, okay? So I like answering, I, I like asking this in a different order. You know, can you find the horizontal asymptote of this? So do you guys remember looking at an equation like this, x plus one over x and finding a horizontal asymptote? Yeah. You take the highest power on the top divided by the highest power on the bottom, and if they're the same, you get a number. That number happens to be what the equation of the horizontal asymptote is. Okay, so here it is at one. Right here is the horizontal asymptote, y equals one. 
Now look at the left end. Isn't the left end going towards 1? What y value is it going towards? 1, right? The right end, it's going towards 1 as well. It's just coming from the other side. So both of these answers for these limits turn out to be what the horizontal asymptote is. Okay. This just shows the answers to those things right there. And this here shows what this looks like in your calculator if you try to use your table. Okay, it's showing if you went from negative 150 to a positive 150 and went by 50s, that at negative 150, it's almost at one. It's not quite there. It's a limit. It doesn't have to hit it. Okay, but that's what it's going towards. At negative 100, it's at 0 0.99, 0 0.98, and then there's an error right here. Why is there an error at zero when x is zero? Uh huh. Perfect. This equation can't divide by zero. And so because of that, you will see error on your calculator in situations like that. That means there's a hole there. Okay, that's exactly what it means. Remember, holes appear anywhere that the denominator equals zero as long as, well, it could be an asymptote there as well, a hole or an asymptote, I guess you could say. If it reduces with a numerator, it's a hole. If it doesn't, it's an asymptote. So I guess this is really an asymptote. Okay, and then you can see that it's a little bit higher than um, one here, and then it gets smaller and smaller, gets closer and closer to one, the higher the number goes. Okay, so tables can be used too. This is a graphical representation, a tabular representation, and then this here is an algebraic representation. So many times we like for you to see all of those. AP loves to use tables, so I will throw tables at you quite often so that you get used to them. Okay? In fact, there's some more in the problem that we have here today. All right, this next one is kind of similar to the one that you asked about the other day. Uh, I don't know his name yet, but Jonah. You asked about one very similar to this. I think it had a six in it instead. Okay? And so here's one that says, but this one's not asking at zero. This one's asking on the end. The graph of as x approaches infinity of cosine x over x. And so here is the graph of this right here. I think the one we talked about the other day was sine instead. But um, for cosine, you can see it comes down and then it goes back up and down and back up. And it keeps going above and below the x-axis. But every time it comes up and goes back down, it gets closer and closer. It doesn't like stay so far away from the x-axis. So it's doing this like this. This is known as an oscillating function. It, you know, it keeps going up and down, up and down, up and down. And eventually, think about like a ball. If you bounce a ball and you let it go, it bounces back up and then down and back up, and, but not up as high each time because there's no energy and power going behind it. And then eventually it doesn't, it just, goes, it just rolls off, right? That's what happens when we do that. And that's almost kind of what's happening right here. This thing here is getting closer and closer and closer to this x-axis that you see right here. And you can see it with the numbers going from negative to positive to negative, then negative, negative. So in between those, there's quite a lot. It goes 100, 300, 500. In between those, it still continues to do that until finally it kind of starts staying at the, what, it's not really a horizontal asymptote here. It just happens to be um, kind of a line that it's uh, oscillating around, okay, which it comes out to zero for that right there. Um, let me also point out, when you get an answer like this, negative 7e to the negative 5, negative 7e, negative 5 in your calculator, that is very close to zero. It actually means... Um, negative, and then there's a 5, and then there's 1, 2, 3, 4, it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? It looks like that. It's at that number, point zero, 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 5. okay? On anything that you ever take in here, you should just put 0 down for that, if that comes out, if that's what your answer comes out to, okay? You guys are in AP Calc. AP Calc is very strict about your rounding. Three decimal places on everything. Okay, Math Excel might not be that, but please understand, Math Excel will tell you where you have to round to. 
AP, at the beginning of the test, there's a disclaimer that says everything should be around in three decimal places. And so one of my trainings that I had gone to years ago, they were talking about this and how some kids have like four parts on an extended response question. And on the first part, they rounded one decimal place. On the second part, they rounded two. On the third part, they rounded three. And on the fourth part, they rounded four, okay? For that person, out of nine points for that question, totally correct answers, but just rounding issues, they marked three points off. Because number one, you were not consistent. Had you rounded one decimal place the entire time, they would have marked one point off because you consistently rounded to the same decimal place. But what they want is three. And they tell you that at the beginning, three decimal places. So I will hammer you when it comes to quizzes and tests if you don't round to three decimal places. Now, if the directions say round to the nearest, you know, 10,000, then you've got to, you know, you've got to pay attention to the directions. If it does not say, it's three decimal places. Okay? That and your calculator always needs to be in radians. Those are two things that you need to remember, and you'll hear me say a gazillion times. It gets sick of hearing me say it, but lo and behold, every time somebody leaves their calculator in degrees or someone does not round properly, okay? So I have to keep saying it until all 27 of you start doing it, okay? All right, next one, vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes happen to be where the f of x approaches infinity or negative. So horizontal asymptotes are where x's approach positive and negative infinity, but vertical asymptotes are where the f of x or the y approaches that. These are your x equals a number, okay? I will tell you when I was in high school, I could never keep it straight. Is it y equals? Is it x equals? What is it? Okay, because I used to think, all right, well, the y-axis goes this way, so that means all the, all the vertical lines should be y equals. And uh, it was wrong every time. So here's what you want to realize. This is the x-axis. If you have a line that goes like this, the only axis it is hitting is the x-axis. That means it has to be x equals. A horizontal line whoo, goes like this. It only goes through the y-axis. That means it has to be y equals. So once I finally came to that conclusion, I never messed it up. Okay. The other thing are the slopes of these lines, you know, while I'm at it. Um, horizontal line has a slope of zero. Think of the sunset. Woohoo, yay, right? It has a slope of zero. This is the one over here that it's not. It's where you divide by zero, and that's where it's an undefined slope. So make sure you keep those straight at some point throughout the year, you'll need them. Now, as far as vertical asymptotes, and these are also more like one-sided kind of um, limits. This here says the limit as X approaches A with a plus sign. That means from the right of F of X could either be positive or negative infinity. And then approaches A from the left side could be positive or negative infinity. So let's say that I have a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. And let's say my graph looks something like this. We could say for this, the limit as x approaches 2 from the left side. And from the left side, it's just saying on the left side of the vertical line, where's the graph going? It's going to negative infinity. And then the right side, the limit as x approaches 2 from the right side, is going to positive infinity. So what's the limit as x approaches 2? It does not exist, right? That's what we focused yesterday, now, or Friday. Now, today, it's going to really be looking at one side or the other, and that, that's, you know, how your answers are going to end, because these are all about the infinities. Like, that's what today is about. Like, a lot of your answers are going to have infinity or negative infinity in them, okay? Whereas, if I would instead have focused this problem on the ends, do you see how the ends are getting close to that horizontal asymptote at zero? 
So the limit as x approaches negative infinity is zero. The limit as x approaches positive infinity is also zero. Okay, so you can have all four in the same problem. So here we have, find the vertical asymptotes of the graph of f of x and describe the behavior of f of x to the right and left of each vertical asymptote. Okay, so we have this. We're trying to do this without a calculator because remember, what, two-thirds of your test is going to be without a calculator. So we have h over 4 minus x squared. So let's think of what we would have done with this last year. Probably would have focused on the denominator. We know we can't divide by zero, right? So we look at this 4 minus x squared and say, where is that 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 does equal zero? Because I cannot, that's where my vertical asymptotes will be. That's how we find vertical asymptotes. We look at where the denominator equals zero. So from here, we'd probably factor this. It factors into 2 minus x, 2 plus x. So we get x is 2 and x is negative 2. That means x cannot equal 2 and x cannot equal uh, negative 2. So we then go to our graph and we say, okay, here's negative 2. It cannot be that. And here's positive 2. It cannot be that. Put asymptote there. Those do not reduce with the numerator like the x minus 2 and x plus 2 do not. That means they're not holes. They're asymptotes. And then from here, you might remember last year then you took and you started plugging in some points. Like I want to plug in a point in here. In here, it's either going to do this or it's going to do this or it's going to do this or it's going to do this. There's four things. That's it. Okay. So find a couple of points and after you find them, then from there you should be able to sketch what it is. All right, so in here, maybe I'm going to look at where x is negative 1, 0, and 1. And that should really be enough for us. So if I plug the negative 1 in right here, I end up negative 1 squared is 1. I have 8 over 4 minus 1, which is 3. So that's 2 and 2 thirds, right? So at negative 1, it's up here somewhere. I don't even have to be that accurate, you know, with it, as long as I know a general direction. I plug the 0 in. I get h over 4, which is 2. So at 0, it is at 2. And then I plug the 1 in, and I get h over 3. So that's back up in that same area as that other one. So that should tell you, right, exactly that that's doing this in the middle. Okay, so from there, I'm going to sketch this. Okay, next, I probably need something over here and something over here. So this is where x is 3 and negative 3, or vice versa. Whatever order you want to do, it doesn't matter. Now, what you should remember from last year is usually in situations like this, um, we might look at this and say, is there a horizontal asymptote somewhere? Okay, a horizontal asymptote, do you remember? When the highest exponent's not the same and it's higher on the denominator, what horizontal asymptote do we have? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Say it again. I can't hear you. Did you hear it? Oblique? Is that what you said? Um, nope, it's not oblique. Looking for... That would be if it's higher on the top. Okay, just to, so that you know. That it's oblique asymptote. It's a slanted asymptote, but that's when the number's higher on the top. What is it when it's higher on the bottom? It's a number. Uh-huh. It is zero. That's exactly right. So when it's higher on the bottom, you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. And you'll see some more like that today as well. So what that tells me is when I plug my negative three in here, if I get a number that's up here that's positive, it's going to do this. If I get a number down here, it's going to do something like that. So all I need is one number in each of those sections. All right, so let me plug the negative 3 in first. I end up with 8 over 4 minus 9. 4 minus 9 is negative 5. 
So this is negative 1.6. It's negative 8 fifths, which is negative 1 and 3 fifths, which is negative 1.6. So that is saying it's somewhere down in here, which means my graph is doing this. Now I need to plug the 3 in as well, and I end up with 8 over 4 minus 9, which is also the same number. So over here, it's also doing something like this, okay? So first, you have to be able to sketch the graph, all right? Do not always use your calculator for that, or you will be in trouble when you get to the AP test, okay? All right, next, the question said, to describe the behavior of f of x to the left and right of each vertical asymptote. All right, so the vertical asymptotes. My first one is going to be, I'm going to focus on this one at negative 2. The limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left, and the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right. Get used to writing this limit notation. Okay, because it will say, on like your quizzes, use limit notation to, to you know, find this right here. All right, so on the left, what am I going to say? Where's it going? To negative infinity. Very good. How about from the right? Positive infinity. Okay, now I, there's another vertical asymptote there, right? I have to give those as well. So I'm going to say the limit as x approaches 2 from the left and the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. So from the left is going to be infinity and from the right is going to be negative infinity. Those are your answers. That that's in green, those are your answers. But if this was a problem that you had in Math Excel, you see, I want to see the numbers that you found. Like, you need to practice doing that. Yes, your calculator knows how to graph these. The question is, do you? Okay? All right, next one. Find an end behavior model for this right here. Okay? End behavior is talking about the limit as x approaches infinity and the limit as x approaches negative infinity. Now it's a big fraction, right? There's some shortcuts on this one right here, okay? The end behaviors are referring to the horizontal asymptote. Horizontal asymptotes are found by taking the highest exponent on the top, the highest exponent on the bottom, and dividing them. I get y equals 3x squared over 4x squared, which is y equals 3 fourths. So the answers to both of these are 3 fourths. Both ends are approaching the same exact thing. They are approaching this horizontal line. Now, like we said just a little bit ago, if this instead was f of x equals 3x uh, plus 5 on top and 4x squared plus 7 on the bottom, or it's higher on the bottom, that limit goes to 0. However, if it was... 3x squared minus 2x plus 5 on top and 4x plus 7 on the bottom, where it's higher on the top than the bottom, then it approaches an oblique asymptote. How you would find the oblique asymptote, that just means it's slanted. How you would find it is good old long division. This would not be a very nice one to do because when I ask you how many times does 4x go into 3x squared, you'd have to actually say, uh, let's see, 
three-fourths x. So that when I multiply that by that, I get 3x squared. That by that, I get plus 21 fourths x. Draw your line and change your signs. Those things would cancel. You have negative 2x, which is negative 8. That'd be negative 20. You're not going to have to do this. And then you'd say, how many times does 4x go into that? And you'd have to say, you know, negative 29. You know, like, you, you're not going to have to do that. But this that you see right up here, this is the oblique asymptote. In this course, we do not focus on the oblique asymptote. Okay? If you don't know how to do long division, that's really kind of okay in this class. All right? So don't worry about that. That's just I'm trying to let you see all the different things. Next one. This problem is written by AP. From here on out, the rest of this lesson, these are AP written questions. Okay, not textbook. This is AP. If g is a function defined by g of x equals cosine x minus sine x over 1 minus 2 sine squared x, then the limit as x approaches pi over 4 of g of x is what? So all the problems that we have left, they might have infinity, they might not. They just fit in with 2, 1, and 2, 2. So I thought it was a good time to throw them in. So do you guys remember your trig identities? Do you remember things like cosine of 2x and sine of 2x? Like sine of 2x is 2 sine x, cosine x. Remember seeing those? But cosine of 2x had three different ways it could be written. One of them was cosine squared x minus sine squared x. That's the most common, quite honestly. There's 1 minus 2 sine squared x, which ooh, we see right here. And then there's 2 cosine squared x minus 1. Well, guess what? AP thinks that you know all of those. Realistically, I know better than that. So, I will print a sheet for you and give you the ones that you really need to study on the sheet by the time that you take this test. <laughs> okay, bless you. Um, you do have to know some of them. You do not have to know the whole sheet for the test. They really narrow it down to certain ones that they like. Okay, but for the purpose of this problem, do you see how 1 minus 2 sine squared x here is the same as cosine of 2x, which could also be cosine squared minus sine squared? So what I'm going to do is I am going to rewrite this, substituting in cosine squared x minus sine squared x. And the reason I'm choosing that one is because I'm pretty sure that's the difference of two squares that maybe factors into cosine minus sine and cosine plus sine. And then I can reduce it with the numerator. So trig identity is definitely something that you need to have knowledge of. Not just knowledge, maybe have a little bit of skill as well. So here I go factoring it. And then we say, hmm, see you later, dude. So g of x, what I'm doing is I'm rewriting it, and the reason that I'm rewriting it, I guess I should have done that first, is if I plug pi over 4 into this down here, it ends up dividing by 0 and giving me 0 in that denominator, which I can't do. Okay, so I rewrite it. Now let's do the limit problem. The limit, as x approaches pi over 4, of 1 over cosine x plus sine x. Oh gosh, that means I have to use my unit circle in my brain too. I gotta remember that too. Yes, you do. Okay, on any given day, you have to know logarithms, trick functions, regular parent functions, all of it. Okay, so this would be 1 over cosine of pi over 4 plus sine of pi over 4. Where's pi over 4? All right, pi over 4 is right here. 
That's that point, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2. Does that help? So now I have 1 over square root of 2 over 2 plus square root of 2 over 2. If I have a common denominator, then I can add the numerators. Well, rad 2 plus rad 2 means I have two rad 2s. So this means 1 over 2 rad 2 over 2, which reduces to 1 over rad 2. <coughs> Math Excel, we'll leave that. You do not have to change it, multiply top and bottom. You guys have, if you made it this far in math, you have earned the right to leave radicals in the denominator. AP would prefer many times that you just leave it in the denominator and not mess with it because it's the algebra and arithmetic that messes you up and if you've made it to that point, they want, they want to just give you the points for it. Okay? Questions on that one? Next one, if f is a function defined by f of x equals x squared minus 1 over the square root of x minus 1, then the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x equals what? So if you plug the 1 in, you get the square root of 1, which is 1, minus 1, which is ah, 9 by 0 again. Pretty much whenever you see a fraction like eight, it's going to be a setup so that it equals 0 in the denominator so that you have to use some kind of algebra to get rid of it. I chose this one here because it is one that AP likes to ask, and it is probably one of the more difficult ones in that how is it that you can simplify this, okay? The denominator is the problem here. We're getting a zero in the denominator, and we've got to, we've got to get rid of that. We've got to somehow take that away. So what you do in this situation, when you see square roots like this, uh, when, when you have that, multiply by the conjugate. Now, what is the conjugate of the square root of x minus 1? Anybody remember? Yes. Almost. Square root of x plus 1. Right. It's just, just a little technicality there. You were probably thinking that. You yeah. just didn't say it. Okay, that means I have to, whatever I do to the top, I have to do to the bottom, right? And usually, you don't even have to distribute the top. In fact, usually if you do, it gets you into trouble, okay? So, the denominator is really the piece we look toward. We FOIL it. Square root of x times square root of x is just x. The outside and the inside always cancel if you're really truly multiplying by the conjugate. And then last times last is minus 1. This x minus 1 that I get here, I need it to go away. That's my purpose. I need this denominator to go away. This is my numerator. But doesn't this factor into x minus 1 and x plus 1? Like so? So do you see what you're going to do? See you later, dude. You literally get rid of the problem. The problem was the denominator. You're going to do what you have to to get rid of it. So now my problem becomes the limit as x approaches 1 of x plus 1 times the square root of x plus 1. The denominator is gone. So now I plug the 1 in. I get 1 plus 1, which is 2 for the first parenthesis. I get 1 plus 1, which is 2 for the second parenthesis. So I get a numeric answer. Again, I like to show you how AP writes questions because they always have a twist of sorts on them. Okay, that makes them a little bit more difficult than how the problems look in, you know, your... your Math think so. I, I have these, I just added all these problems onto it last night. So if we don't get over it, that's fine. I've actually finished the lesson for today. Any of these I don't get over, I probably will, you know, do at some point this week just because I think they're good problems. Okay, here's another one. If f is the function defined by f of x equals x squared minus 4 over x squared plus x minus 6, and the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is what? 
If I plug the 2 in down here, I get 4 plus 2 minus 6, which is 0. Again, I can't divide by 0. It means that denominator, as you see it, must be changed in some way. It looks like the numerator factors, right? So maybe the denominator factors. So we're just going to apply a little bit of algebraic pressure to it here, okay? The numerator becomes x minus 2 and x plus 2. And the denominator is x plus 3, x minus 2. And we say, oh, see you later, Dave. So my new function is now x plus 2 over x plus 3. So the denominator didn't go away, but I changed it and got rid of the, rid of the problem part. It was this part that if I plug the 2 in, it gives me the 0. It's gone now. So we have the limit as x approaches 2 of this function. Now plug the 2 in. I get 4 over 5, and that is my answer. So why do you take algebra before you take calculus? Because you have to use algebra to get the correct calculus answer. Okay. Here's a table. This table starts with 1, ends with 3 for your x's. It goes 1.9, 1.99, 1.999, 1.9999, 2.01. 9, so it's missing, or sorry, 2.0001. It's missing right in here a 2. And that goes 2.001, 2.01, 2.13. 2 .01, 2 and it says the table above gives values of f at selected values of x. Which of the following conclusions is supported by the data in the table? And what you'll notice is all of these are as x approaches 2. Okay. As x approaches 2, f of x approaches negative 1. So right down in here, imagine if you knew what the y value was. Would it be negative 1? It looks like from the left side it would be negative 1, but from the right side it's closer to 6, right? You see that? So, this is not going to be our answer because both sides are not approaching the same number. So the limit cannot be negative 1 if both sides aren't approaching the same number. Same here. They're not both approaching 6. This says the limit as x approaches 2, <laughs> I can't tell, what that is. I have a weird one. That one is from the left. This one has a minus sign right here and a plus sign, and this one has a plus and a minus sign. So the limit as it approaches uh, 2 from the left side is negative 1, and from the right side it's 6. That's the one that's the right answer. But do you remember what I said just a few minutes ago? AP likes to throw tables at you. There you have it. That's a table from AP. All right. I think that's a good place to stop right there. We'll talk about these other four. You can, you can do the entire homework. We got through what you needed for that. Um, these are actually more like 2.1 questions than 2.2 questions. I just like for you to see AP written questions. All right, so tonight your homework is 2.2. The reason it's not due until 3 o'clock, okay, tomorrow, is because I want you to have the opportunity to come to class and ask any questions that you don't understand and then have the school day to go back in and, and just, you know, those couple that maybe you had a question on to go back and fix, okay? Um, it doesn't mean wait till after class to do it tomorrow or you're going to be behind. Okay, you really need to have that before class tomorrow. All right, we have a winner, finally, number 12. All right, and whose phone is this one? I'll just put the ticket with it. This is what a bonus ticket looks like. Is this the first one in your class? Yes. Yeah. I was thinking it was. Okay, so that person, number 12, has blue and gray on their phone. Whose is it? Who won? Yay, good job. So that ticket, you want to keep it. You want to save it. You want to protect it, okay? You can use up to five of those on a quiz or on a test, okay? Or the final exam, but guess what? You don't have one. So, you know, 
All right, you guys are free to get your phones if you want, you know. Have a great day. I will see you guys tomorrow.